We have a special guest tonight. This is Tuesday, and this is family night. And ordinarily, I just hear myself talking with you, and we talk about the Lord. And tonight, I, I decided to to have a priest here who had a, a death experience. We read a lot about that. But Father has something to tell us to all, a reminder, a reminder, a reminder of why God created us, to be happy with him in this life and the next, and that we cooperate with him in our daily lives, be they ever so simple or humdrum, whatever, and that what we do, we do with him and for him and in him. Not a pietistic idea. It's a, it's a truth to live by. Some of us forget. Some of us don't even know why we were born. And I hate to have people say, oh, I wish I were never born. What a horrible thing to say. You know, even if our life was or is miserable, we're going forward to live with God forever and ever. It's hard to remember or even to think of what does it mean to live forever. I had a minister tell me one day his idea of forever was to imagine the world as a giant iron ball. And every thousand years, a bird came and sharpened his beak on that ball. When that was worn down to nothing, that's a moment of eternity. With that in mind, we don't want to give it up too easily. And we certainly don't want to waste it. So I have with me tonight a very special priest, one very dear to Our Lady for sure. Please welcome Father Stephen Shire. Thank you so much. Father, you have an unusual witness, but I think it's one that's uh, very needed today. You were ordained when? In 1973. 73. Mm -hmm. And for the next 11 years, how would you, how would you express uh, to us your life? What was it like? Um, I had no way of comparing uh, my life as a priest at that time. It was a day-to-day -day existence, uh, something that I uh, handled, I thought, very well. I was more concerned about what my peers thought. Mm -hmm. And uh, the priesthood was not in my service to God's people, but rather in what the people thought uh, or how the people thought Father Steve Shire was doing, especially my brother priests. Um, that was my 11 years after the priest, after I was ordained, primarily. Mm -hmm. Well, how would you do that? I mean, how would you come up to their peer pressure? The peer pressure, Mother, is pretty much the same. We did not go to other priests for spiritual direction. We do not go to other priests for spiritual matters, period. Uh, one goes to a rectory to see Father so-and-so, and automatically, you know, Father fixes you a drink, and you talk about sports or anything that has n nothing to do with... Uh, with what priesthood is all about. Consequently, you know, uh, one can never go to another priest with a problem, a seen problem, a mm -hmm. spiritual problem. Mm -hmm. It's just it's not done. It was not done. Well, now, as you, you went along, um, did you feel you were doing anything wrong? Or were you satisfied? Deep down, Mother, I knew 
that I was not doing what I should be, that I was not the priest that I should be. Um, I hid this to the point to where people thought that I was uh, a good priest. Um, and uh, this was, in a way, uh, a sugar coating mm -hmm. for everything that I was doing, which was wrong and lacking. Tell us now what happened. October 18th, 1985, I was stationed in a small little parish in southeast Kansas, Fredonia, Kansas, called Sacred Heart, about 86 miles from Wichita. The one accessible highway to Fredonia from Wichita, the most accessible, is Highway 96, a highway that does not have any shoulders is heavily traveled by semis, pickups, and vans. And I went to Wichita one morning, that morning, the first time I'd ever gone to Wichita, to see a priest about something that happened in the parish. And I returned that afternoon and was going east on this highway when I was involved in a head-on collision. A head-on collision with myself and with a pickup truck with three other people from Hutchinson, Kansas, which is uh, west and north of, of uh, Wichita. Thank God no one was killed. I was thrown from my vehicle and suffered uh, major lacerations of my my head. In fact, the entire scalp was was taken off of my right side. The doctors uh, told me later that uh, due to the concussion that I suffered from being thrown from the act, the automobile, that the right side of my brain um, was partially sheared off, and that uh, many cells were crushed. Uh, I was pretty much unconscious at the scene. Behind me, that stopped until the ambulance arrived from a nearby town called Eureka, was a Mennonite nurse from Frontenac, Kansas. Um, she made mention in a letter later that she tried to help me with the Hail Mary, but she didn't know it herself, so she couldn't. Uh -huh. But I was saying the Hail Mary over and over again. You were? Yes. Uh -huh. Trying to. Trying to. Uh, she knew enough in her profession to realize that I had suffered a broken neck. Later I found out that it was a C2, and the second cervical uh, vertebrae of the neck was broken. They call this, uh, affectionately, the hangman's break. This is what a person that is hung suffers when they are hung. And this... this uh, the vertebrae breaks and the person literally asphyxiates. Had my head been turned either way at the scene of the accident, I would have asphyxiated too. Mm -hmm. I would have died. And so, knowing this, the ambulance drivers uh, treated me uh, respectively, took me to this small hospital in Eureka, Kansas, where the doctor who was there uh, told his uh, sister, who was also a, a nurse, that there wasn't much he could do for me. He sewed my scalp back on my head, <laughs> called for the Life Watch helicopter in Wichita, Kansas, from Wesley Hospital, a huge hospital in uh, Wichita, Kansas. And uh, they, they came and brought me to Wichita. I did not know that I was being transported then either. Uh, I was still un unconscious. Apparently, I was brought to uh, the trauma center of the hospital where I was treated um, and then entered into the hospital. And uh, one of my parishioners from Fredonia called that evening to see how I was doing and was told by the nurses at that time that the doctors were giving me a 15% chance to live. I 
I automatically think of my mom when that, that comes up because I hope to God she didn't know. Because my mom was a warrior. She would have worried anyway. But um, that night I found out later after the accident the Assembly of God minister in Fredonia spent the entire night in prayer he said for me. The Christian church opened its doors to the church for prayer for me. My own church opened the doors. People came all night to the rosary. The Baptists opened their church, their doors. The Methodists, I was on the Mennonite prayer line. In my own uh, thinking, and I may be theologically off, <laughs> but I, I, I would imagine that this is where ecumenism really takes hold in prayer. <laughs> God hears everyone's prayer, and that's why I'm here this evening before you. I recovered from my hospital experience in record time, they said, the staff. I was released December 2nd. I still had uh, what they affectionately called the halo. <laughs> um, uh, it, was, it was screwed in my head in the front and the back. and was, uh, My head was immovable, my neck. I had, had to have no surgery, none. Um, I went home and uh, recuperated there until they could take the halo off and remove me from my, my, my jacket, which was in April. The bishop uh, <coughs> kept my parish open for me, so I returned in May. I had to go out and buy another car, which was very difficult. I had to drive that same highway back to my parish, which was very difficult, but I'm glad I did it. Um, going back to the parish, it was one day that I was saying Mass on a regular weekday, I thought. When the Gospel according to Luke came up, a Gospel that you've heard many times, that I've heard many times, about the tenant farmer who went out to inspect his trees in his vineyard. He told the vine dresser, he said, for three years now, I've come out here to inspect this tree and have found no fruit. Why don't you cut it down and throw it into the fire? Why should it clutter up the ground? And the vine dresser told him, he said, Sir, why don't I manure it and hoe around it and then see if it bears fruit? If not, then I will cut it down. When I was reading this in the church from the, from the lectionary, I'm a German. Things don't happen like this. <laughs> the page became illumined, enlarged, and that page came right off the lectionary toward me. And I finished Mass as best as I could, went back to my rectory, sat in the lounge chair, with a number of cups of coffee, and there remembered a conversation that had taken place shortly after the accident, very shortly. I was before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. I have no way of telling how long it lasted, what we went through, his going through my life entirely, accusing me of various things, all to which I said yes. There was no rebuttal. Now I had it planned, as I think many of us do, that when I got before his judgment seat, I could give a lot of excuses and say, but Lord, she pushed me that day to the point I, I couldn't do anything else. Or, uh, Lord, I, I had a bad day. I didn't feel too good, you know, and and that, that was the reason why I didn't do this. 
We all, we, I, I had a number of excuses. That, that was not the, the case. Everything he said, I was talking to truth. To truth. And when you're talking to truth, you can't give excuses. All you say is, yes, that's, that's the truth. That's all I said. Yes, let's, yes, Lord. I know. At the end, he said, my sentence is hell. Again, I said, yes, Lord, I know. That's the only thing he could have said. That's the only logical thing he could have said. I knew this is what I deserved. I didn't see him. I just heard. Then I heard a female voice. Son, will you please spare his life and his eternal soul? He said, Mother, he's been a priest for 12 years for himself and not for me. Let him reap the punishment he deserves. She continued by saying, but son, if we give him special graces and strengths and then see if he bears fruit. If not, your will be done. There was a very short pause. He came back and he said, Mother, he's yours. Ever since then, I have been hers. Uh, routinely, supernaturally, any way you want to put it. As I was telling Mother this afternoon, there are things that she's told me and done for me that she should not have done and to told me. But this is the kind of mother we have. Now you may be saying, but Father, uh, you must have had a a very special devotion to her before or before the accident. No. I have to give another indictment of myself. Just as hard. But one believes in our Lord Jesus Christ, the angels and the saints, Blessed Mother, in two ways, I think or in one of two ways, with a head, intellectual assent, and the heart. This is what's important. I believed up here. I didn't know anything about this. So. The angels, the saints, our Lord, even for a priest, I believe in them, but they were make-believe friends. They were not real. When I regained consciousness and the ability to think again, that's one of the things that I was very, very well aware of, that they are, they are the only real thing that exists that we're the ones that live in the shadow world that we have only one home it's not here and that a lot of our priorities are mixed up that my own priorities were mixed up that my priorities should been have been to save my soul and help save others which was what a priest should do anyway. To invest in that future, not in the future that I was investing in of happiness here on earth as a retired priest. You say, but, but Father, 
Would your parishioners think that you, I mean, if you had died, would, would, would you have gone, they thought you had gone to hell? No. But let me tell you something. As I told Mother this afternoon, one of the things that I was amazed at was that he didn't take a, po a population or a popularity poll. He knows our hearts. He's the only one that matters as far as myself is concerned and what what anybody thinks. What anybody thinks of Father Steve Shire. He's the only one that counts. No one else. Because I'm alone before him in judgment. I can't point to anybody else and say, but Lord, she made me do it. Or, why don't you get her his opinion of me, and then make up your mind. He knows. He knows. We have a mother. I didn't have any special devotion to her. But since then, she's become everything. At the, at the foot of the cross, Jesus looked down upon her, and the apostle whom he loved and said, Woman, behold your son. Meaning, Mother, I, I give you the whole church now as your sons and daughters. They're yours. She takes that very literally, very seriously. So, any one of us in the same stead would suffer the same consequences and experience the divine mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I experienced, his mercy. But his mother is the one who came and interceded for me. One thing I've learned since then is this beautiful truth. With regards to the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, none of them, not one, can say no to her. They cannot. It's impossible. They will not say no to her. Isn't that somebody that we want on our side? <laughs> Thank you. Father, I'd like you to maybe explain to some of our people. We have a lot of people, obviously here and throughout the country, throughout the world, that really don't, I mean, they love our Lord, and that I don't think they're aware that they do do things for the Lord. So, would you explain to us a little bit about um, what was it about your life that the Lord could say it was only for yourself? Was it just the mm -hmm. opinion of men, or was it pleasure? What was it? My mother, it was more an internal uh, thought process and when he said that I was a priest for myself and not for him, that hit everything on the head, the mm -hmm. nail. Because it didn't matter that he was involved at all. Uh, the prestige of the priesthood, it kept me, you know, in line, so to speak, uh, with my peers. Um, I had no problem in saying Mass, but I had no problem in missing Mass either. None. Um, the Eucharist did not mean as much to me as it did to some priests. Uh, I had other priests uh, go on and on about their first Mass. Mine was never that way. Um, I think it was an attitude, Mother, uh, an attitude of 
not being a priest for, for him, mm -hmm. not being a follower of him, which means suffering, yeah. uh, but being a priest for myself, and I've always run from the cross. Always. I have found out since then that if we run from a cross, there's a bigger one awaiting us wherever we end up. And they're not hard. They're not long. They're not long-lasting. They're not eternal. <laughs> and he's always there to make them as sweet as they possibly can. But uh, I was a coward those 12 years. Um, I was a, a priest who had little training in spirituality in the seminary life, even though I had been to the seminary uh, after eighth grade. You know. Mm -hmm. 12 years but there was no spirituality involved and not like there is these days mm -hmm. in some seminaries um, I was not prepared for the kind of life that uh, I told a priest this life is a life of sacrifice love it or don't be a priest you cannot be a priest. What um, what brought me to the sentence that I received at the end of our Lord's uh, comments was was not so much my priesthood, but the, the fact that uh, I had broken commandments too, and priests are liable even to commandments. Uh, the priesthood, the life of a priest, uh, as what he said, was the icing on top of the cake. The cake was rotten. The icing was bad. Bitter. Uh, I, uh, uh, for those 12 years, I uh, pantomimed being a priest, I was not. And everything was, uh, had to come back to me to give me self assurance. My homilies, the life that I led in the parish, uh, the people's comments, all of these serve to to uh, uplift me. And if I wasn't uplifted, I was the only one that suffered. But there were ways to take care of that. And uh, we all have ways to escape pain. And I took ways of my own to escape that pain. Uh, priests are li as liable to sinfulness as or anybody else. And uh, the mission, my mission, is to let you know, to let priests know, that we are liable to hell. And that hell exists. But also, His divine mercy exists. His love outweighs justice. You're awesome. And the Lord has given you so many graces. <clears throat> before we go to calls, and I almost hate to go to calls, but before we go to calls, uh, what would you tell priests today, especially those who are newly ordained? What have you learned that you would like them to know? The advice that I would give to any priest, newly ordained or uh, 40 years ordained, is to be a priest in service of our Lord Jesus Christ, to be a priest of prayer, that once prayer goes, the priesthood goes, and that we should not be afraid 
of telling things like they are as we see them, as they should be. That's going to make us unpopular, but that's being part of his follower. He never promised that we would be popular in being his follower. He only promised crosses. But the crosses are bearable because he's there and because his blessed mother's there to lighten them. So, Father, it seems to me from, from what you're saying, there seems to be a, a process where where we begin to fail. And it seems to me one is, for a priest, probably the bravery. Um, adoration hour goes, and somewhere in between, Our Lady goes. Is that true? That's very true, Mother. Um, the Father de Grandis uh, called uh, not too awfully long ago, and I had never said anything specific about, you know, what my failures were. And he said, he said, Father, he says, can I just ask one thing? I said, sure, you can ask. He said, did, did you say the office? I thought, oh, God. I said, uh, Bob, no, I didn't. The first time I had made the admission. But a, a priest, as I say, a priest without prayer is dead. A priest without the Blessed Sacrament is dead. A priest without the Blessed Mother is dead. I learned my lesson, but it took him breaking my neck and the threat of eternal damnation just to get my attention. But I would go through the same thing, had it, you know, should, should it be. I would never want to go back to the way I was, ever. Well, I hate to break because I know there are a lot of calls and. I want to, I want us all to think and realize, first of all, the power of our lady. Somebody just asked, well, is she more powerful than God? Of course not. Is she more merciful than God? Of course not. Her mercy comes from God. Her power comes from God. She's a mother. That's the important thing to think, understand. Jesus, eternal word made man, gave her to each one of us as our mother. And some of you that have kind of pushed her aside, please go back. Go back to your parish church. Go down your knees tonight. Some of you are in seemingly hopeless sinner condition, and you failed off. But she's there. She is there. And his father didn't have devotion to her, but I bet you somewhere, his mother, all those wonderful people of various denominations praying for him. So I thank God that you have that experience because not only for your sake, but for all of us. We need to know God expects us to love him. He's a gracious God and a merciful God. But he wants us to love him in return for his love. So we have another call. Hello? Yeah, hi. Hi. I'm from Illinois, and I would very much like to ask Father if at the time of his accident, if he thought he was in mortal sin, and is it possible that, you know, so many of us might not even realize that we are, we are headed for hell? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, yes, I did. And uh, at that time, it didn't make any difference. Um, I used confession regularly but not appropriately. Uh, appropriate confession means that you change your life, you know. And I wasn't about to change my life. But I used that sacrament as a, a fire insurance, let's say. 
Um, <laughs> Fire insurance. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> huh? Didn't work, though. No, it, it didn't. <laughs> it didn't. Father, let's explain something. I, 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 I can feel people getting to <laughs> what we used to call in the old brevi, Ili Confuti. Um, I think what the people don't understand that when you go to confession and you sincerely have purpose of amendment, Mm -hmm. you we say God forgives and forgets. You know, it doesn't hold it over your head. But that's not what we're talking about now. We're talking about not having a purpose of amendment. Mm And, and not really putting forth any effort or having any determination. Is that what we're talking about? That's exactly what I'm talking about, Mother. Okay. That's, Would you that's explain exactly, it a little further? That's exactly the way I was at that time. Um, I, I, had, I wondered how many of my confessions were valid because I had no firm purpose of amendment. Um, I felt sorry, but the kind of sorrow I had was not a religious sorrow. It was the sorrow involved because I knew that if I died with these sins in my soul, that I was threatened by Almighty God with eternal damnation. That kind of sorrow is, does not cut the mustard. Um, confession, you know, you have sorrow for sins because you fear God's punishment. That, 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 that's, that's, that's okay. Uh, that takes care of it. A perfect, that's why we say a perfect act of contrition, you know, because we all can't, you know, be perfect, perfectly sorry. Uh, but we can't be afraid of consequences. Like, if I committed adultery, I can't be sorry that, oh God, if my wife found out, she'd kill me. You know, I can't have, be that, that sorry just for that reason. That's, that's not religious sorrow. But uh, at the time of, of, of my uh, almost demise, uh, I was in the unfortunate situation of not caring. And taking some things for granted, you know, um, which I should not have taken for granted. Assuming some things that I should not have assumed. There's time. There's time for me later on to convert, to become a good priest, to change. There's time. What he was saying is, Stephen, there's, there's no time. I had two small accidents. One, the second one was greater than the first. I told my former pastor, I feel that another one's coming. The next one will be the big one. It was. He had his ways of warning me. I didn't listen. I wouldn't listen. I purposely wouldn't listen because of the pleasure that I was experiencing and it wasn't about to be taken away from me. It wasn't about to take, maybe take it away from me. Father, would you give us your blessing, please? Certainly, certainly. You'll have to stay seated or okay. that microphone will fly that, through okay. the air. Okay, <laughs> very good. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon all of you and remain with you all forever. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Father. Thank you, Mother. You were a great inspiration to all of us. And remember, I have one minute left. Remember when you go to confession... Tell it from your heart. If you don't know what sin is, write to me. 
I am more than happy to tell you all about it. I'll even give you a free book. I just saw Lisa dying right over there in the middle of the thing. But you really have an obligation if you don't know what sin is, and that's a sad commentary, isn't it, to find out, am I committing sin? Just take the Ten Commandments. Hey, what is that? Huh? You study a book on your, your car, study the Ten Commandments, and we'll be back tomorrow night. God bless you.